like you to open a new document we're going to just start with an A4 landscape today uh, so we can go to a pre-select one or you can type in here your measurements I'm going to type in here lesson two this is going to cover a whole bunch of things um, we only need one artboard today we'll stick with CMYK color and click create fabulous now I'm just going to switch this I've got my um, preset uh, workspace but I'm going to go to essentials classic because this is something that you might be more used to seeing as we've been using it in our class so I have here I'm just pressing down space bar which is really handy for moving my artboard around if you're wondering what I'm doing there so I have my artboard I'm going to start off by talking a little bit about strokes and lines so in the last lesson we were looking at shapes and how to move them around how to use the direct selection tool today I want to start with the line segment tool that's this one here now if I click and drag and especially if I hold down shift that will keep a straight line for me if I just click and drag without holding down shift I can make different angled lines uh, I can click once on my artboard and I can type in the angle here and the length so that's quite handy or I can move this dial around I'm going to click OK and Adobe will make that for me. So I've got a few lines that I've started here on my board so you can just sort of see what I'm working with. Now something that I wanted to explain about vectors again is you have a vector line uh, and it can have a stroke and it can have a fill and any vector can have a stroke and a fill. If I go over here to my swatches panel and if that's not lit up for you at the moment it's under window uh, swatches so you can find it there. I can remove that stroke. Now you'll see the line that I was just working on has disappeared. It's still there though. It just doesn't have an appearance applied. So I can select that now and now you can see this preview line here of the vector and I can go over to my swatches panel and I can add a stroke to it. So this time I've added a red stroke to my line and I can do that for my other ones as well. So maybe I'll add a few different colors using my swatches palette there I can just have a little bit of a play with some different colors now much like with the shapes you can use your direct selection tool and you can manipulate the anchors of these lines each of these lines have an anchor at the beginning at the end and a path that joins them these are just straight lines you can have all sorts of lines you can have curved lines you can have lines that meet at the other end that makes a closed shape have a little bit of a go at that moving your anchors around getting used to that also lines can have more than two anchor points and we'll get onto that when we start having a look at this tool here which is my favorite tool the pen tool but today we're just going to have a look at this line tool now there's something else that I'd like to show you once you've used your line tool there's a great panel called the stroke panel and that helps us make some more changes to our vector so open up your stroke panel in window and then stroke and we'll just bring it out here so we can have a look at it now at the moment it's collapsed so we can only see the weight the weight is how thick or thin our line is our stroke so what I'd like to do is this little hamburger menu or the fly out menu here has something called show options we're going to click that and you'll see here we have all these other options that we can start using to apply different attributes to our stroke I'm going to select this one up here this green one First, I'm just going to add some weight to it. I'm going to add some significant weight to that so you can kind of see how that changes. So I've got 10 points on that line. It might look like it's a rectangle now, but it's not. It's just one line that has one thick stroke applied to it. Here we go. I'll go with this one now and we'll add 40. And you can see here, again, it's still this vector line, but it has 40 points of stroke. With that one selected, let's have a look at the cap. So at the moment we have a cap where the um, end of the anchor and it ends flat. We can also go to a rounded cap and you can see how that looks. Or you can go to this one, which is a projected cap. That means that the line will sort of come out over the end of the vector. You can also have a look at the corners if you're going to create some shapes. Let's just do that quickly. We'll just have a little uh, rectangle here and let's add on one of these so we've got a corner that's a bevel join we can try a round corner just to get some different effects we can also align the stroke this is where your vector sits within your line you can have it sitting in the middle that's the default you could have it sitting at the outside we could have it sitting on the inside have a bit of a play with those and see what that does fantastic all right the next one we're going to have a look at here is a dashed line so let's select 
this uh, line that we have here and we're going to add dashed line onto it and you'll notice if I select off and I'm just going to zoom in so you can see I now have a dashed line with that selected uh, so I have six points and four points on yours you might start with 12 and then nothing so uh, this is just the, the 12 and then no gap is the default and you can adjust these so I could change that to let's say a 0.5 and then I could make the next line a 12 point and then the gap might be 17 and you can keep going and keep going actually that looks a bit weird let's start with two that one and look at this line I can manipulate how long the dashes are and how long the spaces are the gaps in between now if I have a look at this line next I could even make it look a little bit dotted so if I have a cap on the end I'm going to make it a bit thicker I'm going to change it to a dashed line here let's try something like one and then a 0.5 gap and see what happens here uh, let's just go backwards there whoops we go we probably need a bigger gap so we'll put one in there let's go two. Oh, still bigger and sometimes it's just about playing around and seeing what you can get look at that so I have a slightly different type of line that I have created which is quite interesting all right let's have a look at these arrowheads I'm just going to zoom back out using my zoom tool we might apply an arrowhead to this green stroke we have up here I'm going to select that and you can see here there are a few different kinds of arrowheads that you can select from and we can again we can take down the weight of our line that's going to change the size of the arrowheads and you can change the alignment as well fantastic so that's all that I wanted to show you with the stroke panel for now let's pop it off to the side uh, and we've had a bit of a play with a few of the different functions there but see what else you can achieve adding different colors trying different weights of stroke adding arrowheads things like that so I'm just going to sit those uh, still on my artboard but just off to the side and I'm going to start working down here next one thing that I wanted to show you was some text boxes how to apply text to your artboard we have our text tool here our type tool so if I hold that down you'll see there's a whole lot of other options we're going to have a quick look at all of these so I have my type tool if I select my type tool and I click and drag with my mouse to create a bit of a marquee there when I let go it's going to create a text box within my text box is something called lorem ipsum or placeholder text this is a type of text that um, tries to copy what normal language uh, normal English language looks like um, so if you don't have the copy or the words yet from your client you can put in placeholder text just to be um, there while you're working on the rest of your design so with this placeholder text here I'll just click off for a second so you can see I've got my text box which is this blue line and it's filled it with some text what I'd like to do is show you how to start manipulating this text inside the text box now you can do that up in the control panel here I much prefer to open up my character panel which is under type character again it's about having lots of options I can add more options with this show more options but for now we're just going to start with the basic options I'm going to highlight this text and we can see here if I click inside my uh, text uh, character panel I can start having a look at some different typefaces I can just start having a look seeing which ones I like or I can drop this menu down and I can choose some different ones that I might like I can change the size that's the point size I can also change uh, let me just find let's start with something like Brandon text so I can change this to thin then italic light light italic some typeface families have a whole bunch of different versions that you can see in here and they're quite fun to play with this one here is the letting so that's the space between each sentence I can make that bigger I can make that smaller this one here is called the tracking if I add to the tracking it moves the letters across evenly so we can have a look at that I'm going to set that back to zero and I'm going to set this back to auto for now now something really interesting that has happened because I changed the size the point size of my type you'll notice this little red plus symbol has appeared down the bottom of my text box what that means is that I have something called overset text I have more text than will fit inside my text box now this is something that's really really important to notice within your work because you don't want to have copy that's missing so you need to make sure that you can remove this red plus symbol 
either by changing the size of the text box, maybe you need to stretch it out, or the other thing that you can do is click on it and you'll see that your cursor loads up with a new symbol and you can click and drag that symbol and create another text box. And you'll see here I have one, two, and this between them is the thread. This is showing you that this text goes down to the bottom of this text box, then links up to the top of this one and continues. So that's just a little bit about creating a type with a type tool. This is called type area tool. It's type within an area. The other way, if you select your type tool again and you just click once on your screen, you'll notice you get a different type, of, a, a way of making type. This is called a type point tool. So I can type in here and you'll notice it's actually already gone behind this character panel here. If I type, it would just keep typing forever and ever and ever in one long line. So this is a different way of creating type. This is really good for things like headings. Uh, but not as good for paragraphs because it doesn't automatically return. It also changes, so it's different the way that it moves. You'll notice before we could change the size of our text box and our type stays the same point size and moves with the text box within it, within the area type. If we do the same with this type, the point type, let's drag that and look, it's changing. It's changing our type, which you have to be really careful about because you don't really want to be stretching your type as you're enlarging it. I'm just going to control Z back uh, and I'd like to show you this. So this is my magic key that I really love. If you hold down shift as you drag, you can keep things in proportion. So that would be the way that you could change the size. You can also uh, use your uh, point size here and make it bigger and smaller. If you've accidentally made one, let's say you've just clicked once and you've started typing and you have this type of point type, you can change it. You have it selected, come up to type and it says here convert to area type. Let's do that. Now you'll see it changes. Now it's an area type tool and the same goes you can convert your area type to a point type. So there you go. That's just a little bit about area type and point type. The next thing that I would like to show you is also under the type tool and it's the type area tool. This is where you can type within an area. So I'm going to select that in just a moment, but first I'd like to create an area that I'm going to type into. I'm going to place some placeholder text in. I'm going to use the ellipse tool and click and drag. Oh, whoops. That's all right. We could have used that one. Let's just use that one. Go with a, with a polygon. All right. So I have my polygon here. Just click and drag that into a space with my selection tool. I might make it a little bit bigger. I'm holding down shift to constrain the proportions. Excuse me, my mouse is playing up today. I need to charge it. Okay, so I have my shape. I'm going to come over here. So I've got my area type tool. This is going to type within this area. I'm going to select that and I'm going to click onto the path. See how you can see it's got path that's come up in pink. With that selected, you'll notice when I click it, it adds some placeholder text inside my shape. I'm just going to select off that for a second and you can see here it's different. So this one created a rectangle uh, when I clicked and dragged to create that. And this one I have selected a shape, clicked on the edge and now it's forcing my type to sit within it. You'll also notice that it removed the attributes that were already associated with that vector. It was originally a black filled polygon. It is now a polygon that has been converted into a text box. So it's slightly different. Fantastic. So I'm just going to pop that off to the side and we'll go to our next one, which is type on a path tool. Now for this, I would like to create an ellipse. I'm just going to show you something quickly. I'm going to hold down shift. I'm going to drag that out because I want to work on just this top part of the circle. So for this, I'd like to just convert it to half a circle, half an ellipse. I'm going to use my direct selection tool. Just draw a little marquee over this bottom point and delete it. And now I have an open path. I have one point here, one point, uh, sorry, one anchor here, one anchor here, one anchor here, and a bezier curve that joins them. Okay, so I'm going to go over to my type on a path tool. Before I do, I'm just going to knock this back a little bit just so we can see some more words because what happens is it's going to put placeholder text at these attributes here. 
and I'm coming over with my type on a path tool to the beginning of my path, clicking on my path and look, it's created some placeholder text that is going around the path that I have created. It has converted the half shape of a circle into a text line that I'm following with my text. So that is how you can add text to a line. And you could add that to any line and any vector. So have a little play with that. So instead of going inside a shape, it will follow the line around it. Now these three here are very similar to the top three, except they go vertically. So I'm not gonna repeat that, but do have a look in your own time to see how that works. I did wanna show you the touch type tool. This is quite fun. This is a newish thing that's come out from Adobe. So it's all really important to keep up to date with the new tools that arrive. And what this one does is as you select separate letters within your text box, you can manipulate them. So I'll start with this one. I can resize it. I can grab this one and I can move it. I could join them together. I could grab the C and I could do something funky like that. Uh, and I could make this one bigger and again move this one across. So see how I can manipulate the type with the touch type tool. But what is amazing about this tool is rather than me having to outline my words and make them into vectors, this is still live text. What that means is I can still go in here with my type tool and I can adjust the spelling. I could put in here is not having the best day ever. Uh, once I've outlined it, I can't add and remove the text as live text. So the touch type tool is really, really fun for that. The other thing that I really love this for is script types. So let's just see if we've got something handy. Here we go. Forever Soulmates. We'll grab that one and we'll just bump up the sides a bit so you can see. So I might want to change how these are linking together. And in the touch type tool, that's really, really easy and handy to do. So I might... Uh, just manipulate these a bit. I might want the V to come down and maybe the G as well might just sort of come down. So I can start manipulating it. I can make it, I mean, that sort of looks a bit weird actually. So I might change that again, but I can keep manipulating it until I'm happy with how it looks. And it's really, really fun to play with. Okay, I'm just going to step out a little bit. Now I did mention a moment ago about outlining type. That is something that comes up a lot that you need to do. And outlining type is about converting live type to type that has been turned into a vector. So I'm just going to quickly show you how to do that. I'm going to click and drag myself out of text box. And whoop, it might help if I could spell. I'm just going to write my name there. So I've got Beck. You can write this in whatever typeface you want to. Now you can see at the moment it's live type. I can edit it, I can highlight, I can change within the character panel its attributes here. But let's say that I would like to turn this into vectors and there's a few reasons why we might do that. It might be going off to print. It, I might want to manipulate very specific parts of the type and I can do that more accurately once it's outlined. So I have it here, I'm ready to outline it. I have it selected. I go up to type, create outlines. And you'll notice it's changed. Now I'll zoom in so you can see. Instead of being live type, it is now converted to vector shapes. So I could come in with my direct selection tool and I could start manipulating it and making these characters my own and just changing them how I want them to be. You know, maybe I want this to be dragged down there. Maybe I want those, whoop, these ones to be a bit closer. See, I'm just nudging that over with my keyboard. Fantastic. So that's something else that we can do with type. So I'd like to move on to artboards now. I've spoken before to you about how this is an artboard. It's like a piece of paper sitting on a table. Our pasteboard's a bit like the table. You can put things on your artboard. You can think, put things on your pasteboard. Uh, and they still exist on both planes. This would be what would print out if I went to print something. Anything that's sitting on that white would print and anything off it would not. I can create more than one artboard and there's a few ways that I can do that. I like to do that generally through my artboard panel, which is over here, so artboards. You can also find it under window artboards. Again, I'm just gonna drag that out so we can have a bit of a closer look at it. At the moment I have one artboard, and if you remember from the beginning, I created that just as an A4 landscape. If I would like to create a new artboard, I go to this symbol here. Now you'll notice this coming up again and again within the Adobe suite. And this symbol always means new. It doesn't always mean new artboard. It can mean new color, 
new swatch, new brush, new layer. It means new. And that's the same in many of the other programs that Adobe has released. So I click new. It creates a new artboard for me with the same values my previous artboard was. It is an A4 landscape artboard. So here now I have two. One, two, artboard one and artboard two. One of the things that I really love about artboards is that I can also duplicate my work really quickly and really easily. Now the reason I might want to do that is say I'm working on this layout and I like where it's going and I want to take it in one direction but I want to save a copy. It can be really handy to have just a duplicated version. And the way that I do that, that's on my artboard one. I can grab my artboard one, drag it down onto the new button here and over we go and see here I have exactly that artboard with all the content that was on the previous one and I could keep editing this I could keep refining that's really handy you can also delete artboard so I have this here artboard 2 let's just delete that one I have this button here I'm going to delete that one so now I have two artboards I can also change the size so let's say I have this artboard but actually look my types going off here I want to make it a bit bigger I'm going to double click over here and you'll notice that I can change the size I can go to a preset I can make it a3 which will uh, adjust my width and height or I could type that in manually I'm going to click OK and you see here now I have a larger artboard. I don't have to have the same shape artboard throughout my document. I can have A4, A3, any size I like, a whole mixture of shapes. So I have my artboards here. The other thing that I wanted to show you quickly in the artboard panel is I can also rename my artboards. So if I double click on the name here, I can change this. So this might be second concept or maybe it's A3. I can name those to help me organize my space and to know what I'm working on. I'm just going to zoom back out there for a second because I also wanted to show you while we're talking about artboards, there is also an artboard tool that's over here in your tool panel. If I select that, you'll notice uh, whatever artboard I was working on becomes highlighted. One thing I can do is I can move it. So I might want to move my artboards around. That might be quite handy. And I can also click and drag out new artboards. So this can be some, another way of creating artboards within your space. So now I have a whole bunch of artboards that I can use. Fantastic. So that's just a little bit about artboards. I'm going to pop those back into uh, the side for now. The next one I wanted to talk about with you was layers. Again, layers are a fantastic way of organizing your space. So I'm going to zoom in a little bit here and I'll open up my layers panel. So under window, layers. It's also off to the side. It's disappeared again. Let me just bring that up and I'm going to move it over into the space. Now layers are also really handy. If you have a lot of shapes, a lot of text, a lot of images that you're working with, it's really important to organize them and know where everything's sitting, not just for your own sake, but if you have multiple designers or multiple artists working on one document, it's really helpful for everyone to know where they need to look for things. I can show you here in layers a few things that we can do. We can switch layers on and off so we can see them. We can toggle on the lock. If the lock is toggled on, you actually can't move anything within the space. So that can be really handy for organizing your space. If I flick this arrow down, you can notice this is everything I have sitting on that layer. And what's really handy, I'm just going to toggle off the lock there. I can also select things via that um, layers area. If I click this circle at the side, you'll notice it selects the group that's there. Let's say I want to select this rectangle. I can do that. So I can select it on my artboard, but I can also select it from my layers panel. Something else that's really handy is I can change the order of things. At the moment I have, I'm just going to delete everything on this artboard so it's a little bit easier to see what we're working on. I'm going to zoom into this first one we were working on. Now the way that Illustrator works is the most recent thing that you made generally will be sitting on top and it's stacked like a stack of papers. So the first thing you created is at the bottom and on it goes until the most recent. But if you want to change the order of things, you can do that. You can do that in the layers panel. There's a couple of ways you can do it. I'm just going to stack these lines over each other so you can see how they have a hierarchy. And I'll zoom in a little bit so we can see a bit clearer. And I'll just change the color of this one so it's a bit easy to see. So at the moment we have, let's just put the yellow so I can see where it is. We have a green line at the bottom. Then we have a purple line, then we have a yellow line, then we have orange on top. But let's say we want to move this green line to the top. 
few different ways we could do that. We could grab it in our layers panel and click it and drag it up to the top. And now it's sitting on the top of the pile. Another way we can do that is to remove it, cut it and paste it in front. So this time I'm going to grab this yellow stroke here. I'm going to command X, which is cut and command F, which is to paste in front. And you'll notice it's popped it uh, just up here on top of our pile. The other way that I can do that is I can select the line. This time I'll bring the purple one to the front. I'm going to right mouse button click and I can go to arrange bring to front. There's also some keyboard shortcuts. So have a look at those few different options and see what works for you because often you need to move shapes around, move lines around, move text around um, so that you have something different sitting in front. Okay I'm just going to collapse that layer for now and I'm going to show you something else about layers. So I'm just going to zoom out for a moment. Here we go and I'm going to name this layer. Now on this layer, I'm going to keep all of my strokes. So I'm going to name this layer stroke. All I did was I double clicked on the layer name. I'm going to add this in here. So now it's called stroke. I'm going to leave all of my strokes on this layer. I'm going to create a new layer down here. Remember that symbol for new within the layers panel. It means create a new layer and select that. I'm going to grab my text by drawing a marquee with my selection tool. I'm going to command X to cut that I'm going to paste it onto my next layer and that's command F to paste in front. Double clicking I'm going to name this layer text. Now this one here is a shape I'm going to create another layer for that so I'm going down to create new layer I'm going to select my shape I'm going to cut that shape command X I'm going to go to my new layer and command F to paste it on there and now I'm going to name this one shapes. So I have now one artboard that has three layers, one that has my stroke, one that has my shape, one that has my text. And what's handy about that is I can lock individual layers. I can turn on and off the visibility for different layers. And this can be really handy when I'm working on different things. Let's say I'm working on some of the shapes, but I don't want to move any of my text. I can lock that text. Now I can't access it. It can't be accidentally bumped around, but I can still move my stroke and I can still move my shape. So that's a really powerful function within layers. The next one that I wanted to talk about with you was adding swatches. So I'm going to pop these layers off to the side for now in my panel and I'm going to bring my swatches panel out. Now let's just bump over here to a new artboard and I'm just going to create myself a couple of circle shapes just to be working on. They're just going to have a fill. Here we go. Now there's a couple of different ways of creating swatches. I'm going to bring the fill to the front and have this first circle selected. Now I can just choose from the basic colors that I have preset within my swatches panel, but it's much more interesting to create my own. So with that selected, what I can do is I can double click on this fill and you'll notice a new panel comes up called the color picker. And within here, I could have a look around, try and find the new color that I want to use. Maybe I want sort of a purplish mauve color, or I might have a hexadecimal code that I'd like to type in, or I might have the CMYK RGB values and I can type those in and I can click OK. Now you notice this has changed the color of my circle, but it hasn't added it as a swatch. So there's another step. Now why would I want to add it as a swatch? Swatches are really handy for keeping color consistent and adding color effectively. Uh, so I use them all the time. So I'm going to have that selected and I'm going to hit new swatch. You'll notice again it's the same symbol for new. Here I go and it's come up with a dialog box. It's just checking. I'm going to unselect global because global is something that I'm not going to work with at the moment but I'll explain in another tutorial. It basically means when something is global and you change that color within a swatch it will change that color throughout a document. We don't need that for now so I'll go back into that when we look at swatches some more. So I'll click OK and you can see here it's added this color into my swatch library. Let's do another one. So now I've gone back to another orange. I'm going to double click again. This time I'm going to go with this kind of burnt orange. OK, hit new swatch. OK, happy with that. And there we go. I've got a couple of new swatches and now I can apply those swatches to other shapes, which is really fun. So that's one way of creating swatches. Another is to have nothing selected and just go straight to new swatch and it will come up with this dialog panel and within here I can have a play and manipulate the 
colors I could go to RGB grayscale there's quite a few in there and select OK and here I go I've got another new swatch which is fantastic so those are two ways of creating your own custom swatches there's also something really great that's built within Adobe which you'll find under the hamburger flyout menu and that's the swatch libraries now you'll notice here there's a whole heap of different ones I'm just going to move this over because it's gone off my recording screen so you can see uh, so art history if you click on these ones there's a whole heap of preset colors which are really great let's just have a look at earth tones so this comes up with a preset library and within here is a folder full of colors let's decide we might have this one so I'm going to click and drag that over into my swatches panel now I could start using those colors within my document and there's a whole heap of preset palettes that you can use which is really really fun to have a look at the other one that I want to show you within that is if you open your swatch library and you go to color books you'll notice you have your Pantone color books I'm just going to open this one up this is something that you might use if you're using spot colors within your work you can type in numbers here to help you find the one that you're looking for so we want that one and when you select it it will also add it in to your swatches panel so have a look through those as well they're really really interesting so that's just a little bit about swatches I'm going to drag that back over into my side panel oh here we go all right I'm just going to click these ones and I'm going to copy them down my page now I could do that a few ways command C command V is one the one I really like to use is you hold down option and drag so now I've got some more dots to play with and I wanted to show you a little bit about gradients so gradients are really kind of coming back at the moment so it's something really interesting to learn there's a gradient tool we're not going to have a look at that just yet we're going to have a look at the gradient panel though and that's here in mine at the moment or you'll find it under window gradient I'm going to click and drag that out so we can start having a bit of a play now I might just zoom in on this circle so we can just play with this one at the moment with that selected and I can see that I've got the fill selected now this can be a bit tricky sometimes people accidentally add a gradient to the stroke and you can't quite see what's happening so do make sure you add the gradient to your fill with that selected I'm just going to click here this is the, the gradient that I'm going to base it on and now I can start having a bit of a play with it I've got linear gradient radial gradient and freeform gradient we're just going to have a look at linear and radial for now and just have a flick between the two of them so this is a gradient that starts in the center and goes to the edge this is one that starts on the side and goes to the other side you'll notice it goes from white to black and it's at a zero angle I can change the angle here I could change it to 90 you know have a look at what happens when you move that around I can move this slider that makes it more um, dark on one side or more light on another side so that's quite interesting to have a play with I'm just going to move that back to zero for now I can also change the colors and I can do that by double clicking on the gradient slider you'll notice here it comes up with all of the swatches so if I've created my own custom swatches they'll come up as well so I'm going to use this one this pink that we created before and I'm going to keep it at hundred percent click back in here and double click on this slider and I might use this green and now we can see here I'm starting to get my own really interesting gradient that I have created I can again move this slider to decide if I want more pink or more green I could change it to the radial see what happens there something else that I can do is I can change the opacity at the moment this is at 100% so that means it's completely solid but I could change that to 50 let's change that to 50 and if I move that now over this shape let's just I'm going to command X command F to put it in front you'll see these shapes can start interacting with each other because the gradient is a little bit see-through in the middle and I could make a little bit see-through on the edge too I'll double click there and I might make this 80% let's have a look at that so you can start getting some really interesting things you can have gradients on their own you can have gradients layered have a bit of a play with that see what happens I'm going to take this back up to 100% again on both ends and I want to show you how you could add another color so at the moment I just have pink and green I'm going to add a blue as well and I can do that by just hovering over part of my gradient slider you'll notice that my cursor changes to a plus symbol if I hit that there I click I get another gradient slider I'm going to double click and what was I adding a blue let's pop this blue in here yeah that looks quite cool okay maybe I'll make it linear again get some interesting things going on 
So that's just a little bit about gradients. You can have a bit of a play in the panel there and see what different effects you can get. But there's quite a lot that you can do. And there's more again when we start having a look at the gradient tool. Now there's just one more thing that I would like to show you in this tutorial. So I'm going to zoom back out. We've had a bit of a look at gradients there, a bit of a touch on that. Uh, so I might just delete the rest of these circles for now, pop them out of the way. And I wanted to show you the brush tool. So within the brush tool, just over here in our tools panel, we have a brush tool and if I hold it down, we also have a blob, a blob brush tool. I like to think of the brush tool as being like a brush that creates strokes. And I like to think of the blob brush tool as being a brush that creates shapes. So we'll start with the paint brush tool just for a second. And you see, I'm just drawing with my mouse a line. Now at the moment, it's still got that um, gradient applied to it. It actually looks pretty cool. But I'm just going to make this just a plain solid um, stroke for now, just so we can see what we're working with. So have a bit of a play with that. Grab your brush tool, see what different things you can do. I'm just using my mouse. You could use a Wacom tablet. They're quite fun. And you'll notice that when I have these lines and I draw them over the top of each other, they still create separate vectors. They are all separate lines. And I'm just mentioning that because the blob brush works slightly differently. So I'll pop those lines up there. I'm going to go to the blob brush now. Now the blob brush I have here is quite small and I'm just going to make that a bit bigger. And a quick way to do that is with my keyboard if I use the square brackets. So I'm just using the right square bracket at the moment and holding it down. It's giving me a nice big blob brush. Now when I start brushing that onto my screen, what you'll notice when I let go, go to my selection tool, is that this is a vector shape. You can see it's different because the line around the outside here is green. That's because we're on a green layer. So I'll explain in here. See how this bit here is green? That means that any of my vectors will have this green preview shape. And it's filled with black. As opposed to this one, which was the paintbrush tool that has a green vector line through the middle and it has a black stroke applied to it. See how they're slightly different? The other thing that will happen is if I go back to my blob brush here and I blob on some more, um, you know, blobs and I click on it, see how those have just been incorporated into the same shape? It's not like this one where I created a line and then a new line and they were separate. The blob brush actually blobs it together if it's the same shape, which is really quite fun to play with. Let's zoom out for a minute. So I've kind of got a few things that I've play, been playing with there. And I'd like to show you how you can apply brushes to your paintbrush tool. So there's actually a panel called the brush panel and that's under window brushes. Let's bring that up and I'm just going to drag it out into my onto my pasteboard so we can have a play. You notice there's a couple that are already in here. So let's select one of our vector lines we've created and we're going to apply this one to it, this charcoal feather. And for this one, let's pop this one, the mop. Excellent. And you can see here, these are still vectors, but we're getting a bit of texture happening. Getting kind of some interesting stuff, a bit of uh, thick lines and thin lines. I can select this one. Maybe I want to add this uh, three point oval. And you notice it affects my line. It changes my line. I'll just move that blob off for a second. Now, there's a whole heap of these brushes that Adobe has collected. Uh, you can also buy more brushes online and to find them, the ones that Adobe has created, you can go into your hamburger menu or your fly out menu and open brush library. Again, I probably need to move this over because it's going off my recording screen. Bear with me. Here we go. Artistic. Let's open the ink. They're quite fun. Now within ink, we've got splatters. We've got different kinds of lines. And every time we uh, try a different one, it'll add it over here into our brush library of things that we've used. So have a look through there. There's heaps of different things. There's some things that are a bit kind of wacky that you probably might not use, but some things like this that might give some really interesting texture to your work. Something else that is important to note about vectors. This is a vector line, but because a vector is a vector, I can apply a stroke to it, but I can always still apply a fill to it. Let me pop those brushes just down there for a second. Let's look at our swatches panel. I've got a black stroke applied. I could change the color of the stroke. I can bring the fill to the front. I can still add a fill in there. So just remember that just because you've created something as a stroke, all it is is a vector and it looks how you apply something to it. In this case, I created a circle shape and I have applied a gradient as a fill. 
this I created a vector line and I have a stroke brush attached to it applied to it that's how it appears so that's all that I wanted to cover in this tutorial I hope you've enjoyed and learned some things please remember to always keep playing around and um, trying all the different options that are there thanks very much <laughs>